Welcome to the Service Dog Handler Chat. I'm Penny Beeman, one of the Crazy to Calm Canine Coaches. And today we have the pleasure of having a special guest, um, Donna Hill here. She is from the Service Dog Training Institute, and we're going to let her tell us a little bit more about herself before we dive into our topic of ethics in the service dog community. We just want to do a quick reminder, um, asking people to stay muted unless you've been given the, the floor, as you will, just because we know um, if it's flashing back and forth between people, that can actually be flashing that triggers seizures to people watching the replay. So if you're not speaking, stay muted. You can always type a question into the chat box or either raise a physical hand or use your reactions to raise your hand. And then we can address questions that way as well. That way we're not flashing back and forth between multiple people. And so with that, go ahead, Donna, you wanna tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Donna Hill. I'm from Service Dog Training Institute. I've been helping people train their own service dogs since uh, 2008. Uh, it actually all started with a YouTube channel because uh, as I started clicker training my then very fearful little German Shepherd mix, um, I discovered how easy it was and the fact that you didn't need to use manipulation. Um, it was all about just marking and capturing and um, being able to let the dog figure out what the problem was. Plus, it was a whole lot of fun. So that's when I started putting it up online on YouTube and uh, just thinking, well, this is great. I do have a, a background sort of in indirectly in service dog. My sister used to, or in, in sorry, in disabilities. Uh, my sister used to teach at the school for the deaf. Um, she was a bit older than I was, but I would go to school with her sometimes and it was really cool. We were always involved in uh, fundraising for guide dogs for the blind when I was young. Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of stuff, it was more family based type stuff. And then, so once I got my education degree, I started taking some special education classes. And then when I was working with my dog, it just seemed to be a natural fit when I saw this with my little, uh, shepherd mix. Um, and it didn't hurt that there was a lot of competition in other realms of just general pet dog training at the time. And I really wanted to find a niche and that became my niche was helping people train their own service dogs. So it gives a little bit of background. I've also got a degree in science and or zoology, specifically in animal behavior, and also a, a teaching degree. That because I've always wanted to work with animals and I've always wanted to work with people. So I got a degree in both to make sure I had both bases covered. Um, and that's kind of the background that I do come from. And so now I have a website that's a service dog training institute dot online. And I run online classes and also in Nanaimo, I do in-person training as well and offer a webcam. Uh, consults for everybody wherever they are no matter that okay so um, I thought uh, today's with the topic of ethics which is a huge topic um, I thought I'd start with looking at a definition of it so I just quickly googled it and Oxford Dictionary came up with this moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity and I found that very interesting because people often separate ethics and morality. And here, morality is actually in the definition of ethics. So I delved a little bit further and looked at, well, what is morality? Morality are principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. And it involves laws and social norms. Okay, that's really interesting. So can we kind of delve a little bit further again into laws and social norms? Well, it turns out, Culture affects the ethics, um, the norms, and the shaped emotions around a specific topic. So depending on what culture you belong to, whether it's um, an Asian culture or a North American culture, Western culture, if you will, um, or whether it's different uh, cultures within um, a, a realm such as, um, and I, I, we don't want to go there today, but right now, real hot topic, of course, is the uh, balanced trainers, which is a culture versus the positive reinforcement, which is a different culture. So I'm just flagging that just to keep that in the back of your mind as we move through. So they are cultures that we belong to. And those cultures do shape what we believe, what we think, and how we approach things. Um, interestingly, also a little bit further research found that um, dogs also have a sense of morality as well. So if you're interested in that, you can delve into that. Um, Catherine Ford in 2015, I think it was, 
uh, did that little bit of a study and it's just kind of opening the door. And her big question was, well, if humans have morality, it had to come from somewhere. Did it come from animals? And she works with dogs. So she looked at dogs and the possibility there. So we're seeing how big this topic potentially can be, right? So anyway, it just, it was quite exciting for me to kind of go there. Um, That's really how- cool. I hadn't really yeah. thought about it that way, but I mean, we know we teach our dogs, at least I do, teach mm-hmm. my dogs to make choices. And how can they make choices if they don't have some kind of sense between right and wrong? Exactly. (laughs) I never really thought about it that way. So that's cool. For me, it really uh, opened my eyes years ago. I had my heart dog, Ollie. He was a, uh, we're not sure what he was. He came as about a seven, eight month old stray. I think he was an English Springer mixed with a Dalmatian because Dalmatians were all like super common in everywhere at that time. And he just blew me away because he knew when I was cheating and he would tell me like, so if we were in play and you know how you kind of, you know, you're you're playing mental games with them. And so you deke them out and that kind of stuff. He always told me off when I was cheating. However, it was okay for him to cheat when he played. So it was interesting that, you know, he could see. And so that's when I kind of started really seeing dogs for who they potentially could be was, wow, like he's got this level of thinking and this level of fairness like very clear. He was also very competitive. And when we started with fly ball, he had zero interest in retrieving balls. But the reason we were successful was because he was very competitive against other dogs. There's that, you know, sort of more of a awareness, self-awareness. And so we use that competitiveness of, oh, the other dog might get it to teach him that he had to run down, pick up this ball and get it. Because of course, his competitiveness was, I want to get the ball. I don't want the other dog to get the ball, right? So we start seeing and just kind of opening our minds up and start seeing this ability in, you know, the other animals, not just in humans and start going, wow, like this is really cool stuff. So I had two German shepherds once learn how to play hide and go seek with each other very, very well. Oh, cool. They both always ran off leash on our property. We have some acreage and they knew that if they just disappeared out of sight, I would recall them. So they would kind of disappear into almost out of sight and make direct eye contact with me. And then once they knew I looked at them and knew where they were, they'd go completely out of sight at that moment. And then I would cue to the other dog, hey, where is? And they'd take off looking for it. And then the dog that was hiding would just all of a sudden, like, um, as soon as the other dog was about to find them, they'd come go sprinting out and run away. And they both would do it to each other. Either one of them on our walk could just instantaneously find a hiding spot, look at me and make sure I saw him when the other dog was distracted, sniffing something. And they both did it back and forth time and time again. It was the greatest thing to see their brains working in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it does. It just gives us that um, doorway, if you will, to an insight into what potential might be in there. So yeah, it, it is astounding. And all the research that's currently happening with dogs as well, and their understanding, their social interactions, their cognitive abilities. Yeah, it's just kind of mind blowing at this time. So yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's just take a look here. So ethics kind of is often um, the elephant in the room, if you will. It's something that people don't really want to talk about necessarily, although in recent, very recent years, comparatively, it is something that's coming up. Um, like Hiko Pup, for example, has the word ethics in her definition of her training. Um, she's one of the, the first in the realm, as far as I can remember anyway, in the recent history. Um, and But now, now, of course, it's becoming much more of a topic that people are actually considering of what it is and, and what it's involved. Um, and I think I think it's important to address why ethics was not often discussed years ago. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the, the focus for teaching dogs or training dogs, as they called it. I, I say teaching because to me, teaching implies a partnership, whereas training is top down. So to me, it's all about a partnership. So we're teaching the dogs. Um, but the focus was on the time and the performance rather than on the process. And that's one big shift that I've noticed uh, since I've been really focusing on the positive reinforcement is the focus is on the process and the process is what drives uh, the success. It drives confidence and especially in fearful dogs like my little shepherd mix, Jesse. And that's 
that was just what brought her out of her shell and was able to move forward with her was the focus on the process of, yay, look, you even tried that. Isn't that fantastic? And then because she tried, she learned she could try more and then she would have more success. And it didn't help that she was also a perfectionist. She was one of these dogs that had to do everything right. So then that really challenged me to break things down into teeny tiny pieces so she could be right every step of the way. Uh, while still building in resilience, because we obviously can't have dogs that aren't resilient. We want um, resilient dogs. So in that process, I was able to build resilience. And, you know, the thing that used to bother her a couple of weeks ago now, yeah, yeah, we can do that. No problem. Let's move on to harder challenges. So you can kind of build in that resilience when you're using those really tiny steps. Um, another reason I think why ethics is often not discussed is that People are so focused on the how to's or the mechanics of how to teach rather than more about the general knowledge of dogs, because that, that's historically with the hierarchical approaches. It's this is the way we do it. Here's step one. Here's step two. Here's step three. And that's really where people are at generally when they come into training is, well, how do I do this? I have a problem. How do I solve it? I want, you know, I want a how to video, which YouTube is fabulous in resolving um for and I'm, I'm into gardening right now especially uh, aquaponics and I mean there's tons of aquaponics videos you go on there and you go how do I you know grow a parsley how do I you know we're using hydroponics how do I um grow peas what you know and you can find it and it'll tell you step by step by step and the same applies to dog training or dog teaching um but while that's useful, now we're also finding out that the whole general knowledge about dogs, because there's each situation varies so much, and you'll have little tiny changes in the environment or in something that's going on emotionally for the dog, and that can shift things radically in the dog's responses. So it isn't just a how-to step-by-step anymore, it's there's a lot of problem solving going on. And in order to do problem solving, you have to have knowledge about the dogs. You have to be able to read the communication to understand what they potentially might be feeling. You have to understand what changes you need to make in that environment for the changes that you can make, or maybe removing the dog from that environment or adding more distance. So there's all these really more subtle stuff that we have to get involved with right away in order to be successful um rather than the old just how to approach i think that one is really big with the clients that i see and even myself when i was training my first service dog is that we have all these things you know all these check marks we want to be able to cross off our list but actually stopping to think about all right what is this check mark actually accomplishing and is my dog ready to be able to accomplish this thing. You yeah. know, um, I'm kind of finishing up the training on my foster SDIT Roz. And so I've had like, we've lately been working on restaurants and kind of checking off various levels of restaurant training. And it's still, I have to remind myself, okay, does she need this? Do we need to go slower here? Do more of this? She's pretty resilient. So like, I actually messed up on her first restaurant training because I wasn't expecting it to be bad, as bad as it was. But we were in a much more crowded place than I anticipated. And we stuck it out. She did wonderful. But was it good for her? Had she been another dog, it would have been a case of where, yeah, we would have needed to leave and revisit and do something different. She she did fine with it. But, you know, we kind of have to look at that and yeah, these are our plans, but do we need to change our plans if it's not working for our dog? Yeah, definitely being flexible in the moment for sure. Um, in teaching, there's actually a term, it's called formative evaluation. As you're going, you're kind of doing these mini evaluations by watching the responses of your learner. And then in the moment you're saying, okay, well this, this person or this learner isn't getting what's going on or isn't getting the concept or in getting that little piece that you're hoping they were. So we need to back the truck up and do something different to help them get to that point. Um, so it's a constant, you know, moving forward, moving back, maybe moving sideways or laterally in order to get to your quote unquote end goal, which of course there's the process part of it, right? It's the moving around in that middle space between beginning and product um, that is the process. And that's where the focus should be. Um, and Penny, I agree as well. Um, maturity, I think, has a lot to do with where the dog is at as well. 
you'll see some handlers taking dogs that are way too young for certain situations. They're just not mature enough, whether it's physically, socially, emotionally. I mean, there's different kinds of maturity, right? And so if the dog is missing maturity in that area, and then they're trying to make the dog fit that mold in that situation, it's setting the dog up for failure, which we don't want. We want to build that confidence. We want to set them up for success. So that might mean pulling back, maybe not doing as much public access or doing it differently somehow, or maybe going out with other people, um, but changing something to help the dog be successful in the current moment where they're at, knowing that maybe in a month or two, they might actually be ready for what you were thinking they were ready for. And that's okay. It might take a month or two to get there. You will eventually get there and the dog will be that much stronger, more resilient, happier, more confident in doing so by you going through that process in order to get to that point a couple months later than what you planned. I totally agree. And sometimes it's not always just the dog especially for those of us that are working with um, clients that are training service dogs, we can tend to get focused on this is what we really wanted our client to learn. But if our client isn't in a place where they're able to learn that lesson right now, then maybe we need to be flexible to switch tracks and choose a different lesson that may be more fitting to their lifestyle in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's where um, some quote unquote, back training, and people are always worried about their timelines. Here's the timelines again. But I always say, and they say, oh, well, how long is it going to take? Or, you know, well, we're, are we behind other teams? There's all these those kinds of questions. And I always say you are where you're at. You know, both you and your dog are, are where you at. You need to learn what you need to learn right now to move forward. And that's where the focus should be is let's learn what we need to learn now you are where you are, and then you can move forward. And that seems to help a lot of people understand. It's not a competition. There is no deadline. Um, the other thing I often tell people is that it can take two and a half to three years for an owner trainer to reasonably expect that their dog is ready to work in public places or to take a certification process if that's what's um, recommended in that area where they live. Um, but real, you know, realizing it's a long timeline. It's not just, you know, in six months, your dog's gonna be ready to go. It's it takes as long as it takes. It's kind of like a piece of string, right? It depends on what you're using it for, how long it needs to be. That's the process. So some people that are working more slowly because of their disability at home are certainly going to take longer because they can't get out for um, training in public or maybe they can't get the additional help they need as far as like distractions or whatever. So that process is going to take longer for their dog to get to the, the ability to work in public. Um, or some other people, maybe they're coming in and they have a dog that's just a real fast learner and they themselves are really skilled. Well, that's going to be a lot shorter process and take a shorter, but they still might get stumped at certain parts and go, oh, you know, I don't know how to do this or this isn't working. We need to back the truck up, rebuild some of the foundations, and then we can move forward to do what it was that I was hoping to do. So it, they, they are really, really individual. And that, that's a key. In, in service dog training and any dog training, honestly, but particularly in service dogs, because we are dealing with people with disabilities. And there's, I think, a level of frustration, especially for some disabilities more than others. And the expectations are pretty high. So we, we kind of have to, you know, just assure people that where you're at is where you need to be right now. That's just where you're at. And we can move forward from here. We can always move forward. That's totally, totally you know, where I focus with my clients and with the dogs I'm training is that, you know, we, we can think about, sorry, I got a very belchy dog right now for some reason. <laughs> Don't know if that's getting picked up or not. Nope. <laughs> <But> she, she's <laughs> like three inches away from my face and belching in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of you. <laughs> but, um, you know, that whole idea of if the dog is not feeling it and if we even as a person are maybe just having a bad day do we consider changing our plans for that focus you know can we change what we're doing in that moment to better meet our needs and our dogs and that's the most important thing to me when it comes to looking at um you know, ethically training a service dog. I get a lot of people that tell me training service dogs in itself is unethical to the dog, but you can do it ethically. You really can. 
It may not be exactly the same way that I would do it, but you can treat a dog with respect and still train them to work for us. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the difficulty is ethics aren't black and white and people assume it is right. It, it's a continuum. It's um, you know, there's, there's either end of course, and then there's somewhere in the middle and it shifts one, no one person or one organization or, or culture stays in one spot all the time. There's a shift and the details are what's important in that shift. You know, some situations you may say, okay, well, this is acceptable. But then when the situation slightly shifts, now it's no longer acceptable. And we need to rethink and go, okay, we need to change something in order to get back into that realm of acceptable for our particular culture that we're working in, right? Whatever, whatever culture that might be. So I I think that's another big picture is people often think it's black and white, and it really isn't. It really isn't. And it shifts in the moment. So, um, I think what it has to do with as well is people's comfort zones. And basically, um, if, if a person is in a comfort zone, um, they're going to be a lot, have a lot higher wherewithal in order to think, okay, is this good for my dog? Is this good for me? Is this good for people around me? You know, and look at the bigger picture. Uh, whereas if they're in, at a low ebb, they're not going to be able to do that because they're focused on themselves. And that's what is primary in that moment. And this is where it, you know, the, the real focus is on, uh, with service dogs is it's all about the handler and it's like well yes but if you're not able to extend that to include your dog as part of your team then maybe this is the time that we should not be working we need to go home we need to settle we need to you know figure out get healthy whatever that looks like to the degree that we can go out and we can help our dog do the best he can do so that we can be the best team we can be right so and that's often forgotten is and, and sadly, I have had clients come to me and it was all about having the dog as a robot. And basically the robot was there and it was being ordered around. Um, and then when the dog was off, it was just being a dog and basically very little attention was paid. And then when they needed it again, it was there. And it was like, to me, this was like, hang on, why'd you get a dog again? Like to me, a dog is a family member at all times first. That's the number one. Uh, but they were clearly seeing the dog as a mechanical tool to help with their disability. And so there, I mean, there's a huge shift for them right there is to look at what the dog's needs are um, and all of that. Right. So, but that has a lot to do with the comfort zone in whatever realm that they were in. um, They were saying, okay, this is just a tool as opposed to, you know, including the dog in part of their family as part of their team. So, I mean, that's a classic example. So, yeah, it, it it really, really varies where people are coming from, how stable they are, how comfortable they are. Um, and the more comfortable people are, the better ethical choices that they can make because they have that wherewithal to do it. They have the means to do it. They have that luxury, if you will, of being able to make those kinds of choices and decisions for them and their dog and the environment around them, the people, you know, all of that big, big fix. Um, and I think that's where it it, it shifts. So that the the closer to comfort that we are and, and stability, then the more able we are to make those kinds of choices. Whereas if we, and we're more focused on the process, whereas if we're um, at a low ebb and we're um, not able to focus on anything other than ourselves, whether it's due to pain level or um, you know our thinking, the way we're thinking, um, then we tend to focus on the task and just stick with, okay, we've got to get the task done. This is all it. That's all in, end all and be all rather than all the other stuff kind of gets left behind. And I think that's an important piece to remember for our clients that are students, um, because some days they're going to come in and they're going to be closer to the process and, uh, you know, they're feeling really good. They're having a great day, but then some days they're coming in and they might be in pain. And we all know how pain affects us, right? It really affects our judgment. It affects what we do. So we have to remember that and go, okay, you know, let, I can see why today they're only focused on the task. They're only focused on let's get this done. I got to get out of here because they just want to get out and feel better themselves. If getting out of here means they get to go home and lay down, right? Um, Then that they're going to be more comfortable. Whereas if they're feeling fine, then it's like, yeah, we got more time. We can process this. Let's take our time with the dog, make sure the dog's got it all correct. So there's that shifting even in the moment and, and day to day um, in our ethical choices. And we all do it. I mean, even though we think, you know, I'm the most ethical person. Well, no, there's going to be some days where, you know, um, it, where you make choices that you would never in a million years otherwise do if you were feeling, a, you know, really good. But if you're at a low ebb, it's like, you look, let's just get it done, get home, do whatever. So 
we have to acknowledge that we can't beat ourselves up over that. Like that, that's a key thing is we can't beat ourselves up for stuff like that. Just as we can't beat ourselves up for training methods we used to use versus training methods we use now. I know a lot of people are, are like that. And they're like, oh, I can't believe I used to do X, Y, and Z to my dog. Um, and now I don't. It's like, you know what? You learn better, you know better, you do better, you move forward, and you're in the moment with what you do know, right? And that's how we move forward. We can't hang on those um, bad feelings. You got to move past them and, and just keep going and, and do better and feel better because you do, you feel better when you're, like I said, that was what sparked my YouTube channel was this is really cool. Anybody can do this. You don't have to have physical strength. You don't really have to have, um, you know, too many skills beyond being able to observe and being able to click a clicker or say yes um, and deliver a treat. And if you can do those things, it'll move teams forward so much faster and so much easier and put it in the realm of so many more people than had been, in the past being able to do training. So yeah, yeah, pretty cool stuff. I know one of the um, debates, if you will, or places where people tend to take sides is um, something like it drives me nuts to hear this and I understand it, but to hear somebody say, they're my medical equipment, which Again, I mean, legally, a service dog may be considered like medical equipment. And as you said, they're more than that. They're a family pet first because they're always our pet. But, you know, just just the terminology and the way that we word things can really impact how not only we feel about our service dogs, but the other people, the other handlers that we're speaking to. So yes, my service dog is medical equipment, but he's always going to be more than that. And if I just called him medical equipment, that leads people to believe that we can then order them around more and stick to that more task trained. He has to do this because this is his job. Yeah, he's now, an inanimate object as opposed to a living, breathing being. Right. He's that yeah. robot. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I don't want a robot. I never have. But I mean, I think that's one of the big things that gets debated a lot as far as ethically, is it, you know, is that actual or not? And I see Cindy has her hand up, so she must have something to share here. <laughs> They're finally unmuted. I was just going to say, I, regardless of what Nick's legal definition is, as far as where he can go and what he can do, which is as a service dog, he can essentially do the same thing as a human attendant. And I tend to think of him more as a canine attendant because he does tasks. He helps me with stuff that I potentially would have a human attendant help me with, but he's not human. He's a different species. And I, while that's not the legal definition, I think if people thought of their, service dogs in that manner as opposed to medical equipment we'd have a lot more we there'd be a lot less of the issues going on with the service dog in the service dog community yeah i i think part of it too though is historically where service dogs came from the programs and and the um, images that they portrayed, these dogs have to be perfect. And they even came up with, you know, intelligent disobedience as a, a way of, um, you know, saying, oh, you know, the, do the dog is being disobedient, but it's a really important reason. Um, and it's, I, I think that's where it comes from, because historically, that's what like, that's what I was exposed to as a kid, we saw these guide dogs for the blind, and they basically were perfect. And they were, you know, they would stop at the curb, and they would sit and even that you'll still see carryovers today, people insisting their dogs must sit, they don't understand why the dog sits at the curb. And that was actually just to indicate a change in elevation for the blind handler, but they just are following that and doing that because they saw someone else do it. And that just shows you an example of how important the culture is and what people see around them because that's what they copy, right? And they don't necessarily understand why they're copying or why they're doing it, but they will do it. And it's like, okay, no, no, we need to um, take a look, back the truck up, if you will, and take a look at, well, why were they doing that? Well, it's only to indicate a, an elevation change. Well, is it practical for um, a, a person with psychiatric disorder, is it necessary for them to have their dog sit at a curb? No, it's not part of the function that the dog needs to do for them. It's not a task. So why would you stop and have your dog sit at every curb? It doesn't make sense. And so that's one thing that I will coach my 
students is to look really hard at what they need and what they don't need, according to the quote unquote social norms that they've seen in the past and question those because it's, it's what we think that we need or what we've seen in the past that we tend to go, but we don't necessarily need them. So we have to question, we have to move on and say, well, what is practical? So for me, the vast majority of dogs that we train, if the dog stops when I stop at the curb, that's all they need to do. They can stand there. And then when I say, okay, let's cross to make it safe, we go across together and away we go. We don't need to have a sit. So just some real small, small things like that. And that takes a lot of energy for some teams is to focus. And they spend a lot of energy on teaching their dog to do this auto sit, blah, blah, blah. And it's really not necessary. And they could be spending their time and energy on other things like teaching their dogs concepts so that the dogs could make choices based on what they see in the environment and what the handler is doing. So the handler doesn't have to tell them what to do every second of the day. That takes a lot of energy from the handler to do, right? So there, there's that that's all involved in ethics too. It's all these little tight little pieces that just sort of tumble down and, and fall out like a waterfall. You start at the top of the waterfall and then you kind of realize where it falls, right? I totally Ashlyn love says, that idea of, you know, challenging the social norms as in why is that a norm in the first place? And how does that impact me as a handler and my dog as a dog and family member first versus doing it just because. And I tell this people, I tell the people all the time that if you see my dog in a store, he looks like a service dog or in a public place, hospital, you know, pick it indoors somewhere. He looks like a service dog. But if you see us out on a walk, he is like, you don't be surprised if he looks like he's dragging me down the road because a for one, I need that forward momentum pull to continue to go on the walks with him. <laughs> but B that's his time. And if he really wants to get to a smell, as long as he's not hurting me, you know, if he's causing me pain by dragging me down the road, then I have easy ways to stop him. He's 70 pounds. I'm almost 200 pounds. You know, I can stop him if I need to, but if I'm feeling good enough and I can jog the 10 feet so that he can get to the tree faster, I'm going to do that. Yeah. So it's kind of that um, we get judged a lot when we're in the outdoor environments because I'm in a rural place that a lot of people, you know, they might see his collar says service dog. It's like, that's not a service dog because <laughs> we get so used to seeing poorly trained dogs. And it's like, well, think about environment with what you're asking from your dog. To me, it would be totally unethical to ask Azul to stay in a heel the whole time on a walk that is, you know, met for his exercise and his enjoyment. Right. He wouldn't get any exercise in that heel position because he wants to move faster than I do for one. <laughs> but for two, I mean, that's just, that's taking away from his dog time. Yep, and his dog nests as well. Right. Mm -hmm. need to sniff, he's need to do. Yeah. And I mean, he, he needs that downtime. Absolutely. That's an important part of uh, recovery and stress management and um, just maintaining your dog as a willing partner. Because if, if we don't get just like us, if we don't get that time down and that time to be who we need to be, you know, whether it's puttering in the backyard with for us people, right, or whether it's sniffing for a dog, if they don't get a chance to be that, then they're not going to last very long and you're going to get a burnout. And then you, then you have that ethical roller coaster happening in there is okay well you know the dog isn't recharging he needs to recharge his batteries just like we do oh yeah um yesterday on the drive home we stopped in the sierras before uh, before we got into sacramento and it was a completely different environment than what nick is used to and i was trying to get him to go potty because we wanted to get on the road but I didn't, I didn't have him labeled or anything. And so I just, I let him sniff because I knew that that was needed after his high stress week and being, and that high stress week was also around completely new um, smells because he had never smelled av gas before he, you know, he'd never seen a lot of the stuff that he'd seen. And I didn't ask a whole lot of him while we were there. And I think it's important, you know, when we take our dogs into a new environment like that, we need to take into consideration what do we expect of them 
in a com- brand new environment, high stress environment, because, you know, there's probably a half million people there, a million people there, because it, it was he, it's an international race. Massive, massive chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then there's food smells. If you add into it, food smells everywhere. And, you know, there was a lot of air scenting going on. And, I, you know, I don't care if he does that. He, when I needed him to go with me, he went with me. And then the other thing that Guide Dogs does, Guide Dogs for the Blind does here, is they have the handler take the vest or the or the um, harness off the dog when it's time to eliminate. I don't do that because it's a hassle. To, it's just one more hassle my brain has to deal with. He knows when he's allowed to go. I, he, he has a cue for it. And if I don't give him the cue, unless he can't, cannot hold it, he won't go. Right. And, yeah. You know, yeah. We, I mean, we don't take our uniform off to go to the bathroom, right? No. If we're working. So why would we take it off the dog? Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And if it's a, a stress for the handler, then let's eliminate that stress. Yeah. That all ultimately travels down to the dog. Right. So mm-hmm. the environment that's around the dog. No, that's a great example. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say I'm with Ashlyn. I don't teach an auto stop or sit when I stop and but I'm also teaching competitive obedience. So there's when he has a cue for, for competition for an auto sit and, you know, he knows when it's not necessary. Right. Yeah. He won't do it. Cool. Okay. Um, So we, we kind of, when we were discussing earlier and setting this up, we kind of came up with three sort of main topics of, of ethics um, I'm just going to introduce them here and then we can specifically go in and delve into them. So the three ones we came up with were um, interacting and teaching the dog, which we sort of touched on a little bit. Um, the second was interacting with other people, specifically other handlers on internet communication and also encountering other teams in the p- public. So how do we deal with that? Um, there was also within that in- interacting with people was other trainers, right? That's a- an ethical it, a decision oftentimes, and also members of the public. Now, the members of the public issue, I don't think we should talk on here just because it's talked to death. That seems to be the only thing that anyone ever talks about is, how do I do when, you know, somebody ran their cart into my dog? That kind of stuff gets talked about all the time. So I think it would be a, um, a not a waste of our time, but certainly our focus would be spent um, spending, our, our focus would be better spent looking at other things. Uh, if you will. And then the last part would be public access issue slash legalities. So those are kind of the three things we'd identified. So I thought we could just delve in a little bit more on some of those specific things. Um, So, okay. So the first thing was interacting and teaching your dog. So we've sort of mentioned that. So moving from task-based training to process or dog-centered training. So what are the dog needs in the moment? Um, Things like what are What challenges, and this is a great question for every handler team, is what challenges or roadblocks are happening in the environment? So whether it's behind the scenes, whether it's in the physical environment um, or the social nature of your dog or emotional, you know, maybe maybe there's a, you had a tough day yesterday or maybe just earlier in the day you had a tough piece. What kinds of these kinds of things that are happening with your dog while you're training and we have to, Um, acknowledge those and figure out how to change those to make the job of learning easier for our dogs in that environment that we've chosen. Um, So, so I was kind of thinking along the lines of, so, so, you know, an obvious one. So um, there's kind of five areas that I look at when I look at a dog, one is medical and medical always comes first. So I rule out any kind of medical issue. And most people think, okay, you know, that's like things like hip dysplasia and, um, you know, and, and the kind of bigger issues. Did he have an injury of some kind? Um, that kind of stuff. But there's also other medical, there's really subtle stuff. And I can give you an example. Just recently, I was working with a young dog. Um, I normally work with them remotely, but they had traveled and they stayed here for five days so that I could work one-on-one with them and their dog. And about day three, I started noticing that when the dog was getting up, like we do a training and then I give the dog an off time, like a break and just wherever. And it's just on my um, garage floor on a slick cement floor. 
about the third day, I noticed that when the dog would get up, he kind of limped for a couple steps. And I was like, huh, what's that about? Like, is his leg falling asleep? Is he have hip problems? Like, so there, there was some kind of, to me, a medical issue going on. And so we kind of watched it and it, it went away. Like, like I said, it was only a couple steps and then he seemed to be fine. And we went on with training and we weren't doing anything crazy. We weren't doing jumping or, you know, anything like that. It was just some real basic, like nose targets and, and uh, that kind of behaviors that weren't physically strenuous on the dog. So there was no reason that the dog should be doing that. So anyway, so the next day um, we noticed that he, uh, was walking along and one of his legs slipped. It was one of his back legs and it sort of just slipped as he walked. And I thought, okay, and all the dogs I've had in my garage, including my own, none of them have ever walked like that and slipped. So I was like, okay, when you go home, you need to talk to your vet. So anyway, so they kind of went, yeah, yeah, no, he's fine. And, and of course there's a bit of background history that I kind of put two and two together was they had told me that their youngster was quite prone to climbing on the dog. And I was like, ooh, this is not good. And I'm like sitting on the, the dog like a horse when it's laying on the ground. And of course, we know this can potentially be hip issues. So they went home, kind of ignored my advice, I guess, because it was like four or five days later, I get this email and they said, oh, he was walking along a sidewalk. His foot went into this little ditch, like a three inch ditch. You know, sometimes there's like a cut between the cement and the grass where they make an edge. His foot went into there and then he started limping right after that. And so I said, well, take him to the vet. So they took him into the vet and he says, oh, well, you know, I think it's just soft tissue issue or soft tissue damage, you know, don't worry about it, it should be recovered in a week or so. And I said, no, I would push further. That doesn't sound like it to me. So they pushed further, ended up going to an ortho vet, had him x-rayed. Well, lo and behold, he's got a subluxing, which means basically dislocated hip, and he's got moderate to severe arthritis. And this is at nine months of age. So there is an issue that nobody had ever seen before and only because they had come and I saw that myself and I kept pushing. Um, these, these are ethical issues because you've got a dog that's working with potentially a high level of pain. Of course, a lot of them mask it really well. And you don't know until something like, you know, he tripped on this ditch and then had to take him in. And right now we're just kind of waiting to see what the outcome is going to be. Is he going to be able to be a service dog? You know, are they going to end up being able to put him under um, and have surgical repair done? And is it going to be successful? We don't know. Time will tell. Um, but he's just a young dog. He's nine months old. So Really subtle stuff can lead to bigger problems. And we need to pay attention to those subtle stuff in the moment and make note. I mean, the first time it was kind of like, yeah, he could have been, his leg could have been asleep. Okay, that makes sense. But then when you start seeing that repetition of stuff, that's when you start paying attention. And you start literally recording. If that were my dog, I'd be recording date, time, where it happened, what's going on. Because the more kind of information like that that you have, the better the decision making you can get. And the easier it is to see those patterns when you when you look back. Of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. If you have that record, you can start going, okay, here, A to B to C, here's what we're dealing with. And it also gives the vet um, more information to deal with as well, rather than just, he tripped on a ditch. I know along those lines, another debate that was recently happening in a group of all places, a Facebook group, <laughs> was um, a dog had been recently diagnosed with a seizure disease. Mm. And so Handler was like, well, to me, that's an immediate you know, career change, no longer able to do service dog training. It was young, right around a year old. And so they had put all this work into it already. And other people are like, but if seizures are treatable, you know, if meds work and control it, does that mean the dog then still can't be a service dog? And, you know, just trying to decide that ethically is huge for a person. Mm -hmm. To me, there's a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. You know, A, um, how demanding is that dog's job? B, how long of a time, like, are they going to find it stressful going to the grocery store with their owner? Stress causes seizures, you know? <laughs> so yeah. if they don't find that kind of thing stressful, then maybe they can do that once a week trip to the grocery store. And, you know, trying to decide that it becomes a huge ethical dilemma that I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to it's got to be a personal decision based on the support needed and the dog and how they handle the situation. Yep. Absolutely. And that's where those shades of gray come in, right? It's about, and, and knowing the situation and knowing all the variables, there's always the pressure to put, keep the dog working, right? Because that's the expectation. That's the reason why they had the dog in the first place. So there's always a medical uh, and sometimes the medical, need of the handler in the moment trumps the dog's needs 
Um, but then maybe they need to step back and look in the long term as well. So, and again, you know, you're juggling that is how often is it going to happen? Is it just once a week or is there multiple situations? Um, I had a, another dog that came to me that was, had already passed um, a certified, like a provincial certification and the dog was going to be needed to assist the owner for flying. And in my opinion, the very first time that I met the dog, it was not a dog suitable for flying. It was, it had, the history was not great. It was from a remote community. It was not well socialized until it was at least four months old, spent the time until that in um, A, in the wild and then B, in a shelter situation until it was adopted. Um, and then the dog had some space issues, like personal space issues. It just did not like people and other animals in its personal space. And when you think about an aircraft, everything's crunched real close. Right. Um, and, and it was, it was tough because I had to help the owner because she was set. This dog was going to be her savior. And because she needed it for work, she had to, it, this was going to be the only solution. And I had to help her come to the conclusion that this dog was not suitable and that it was not going to be successful and not going to be happy and going to be incredibly stressed in the long term If this is, you know, on a weekly basis, the dog had to fly. And it wasn't until we actually took the dog on a public transit bus ride for exactly, uh, I think it was about 40 seconds because they were sitting in that, um, you know, the, the downtime zone and he had to drive to the actual bus stop. And it was literally about 40 seconds. We got on after we'd done some, you know, just getting on off all this kind of stuff. The bus wasn't even on. He turned the engine on, drove 40 seconds and the dog just melted to the floor and started shaking. And, and it wasn't until she saw that, that she kind of went, oh, I don't think this dog's going to be suitable for that, right? But, and so it, we get so invested as handlers um, and we see this and this is what we need. We really have to remember that the dog has needs too. And this dog may not be suitable for that particular job. It was fine at home. It was fine in the car. It was fine in any other environment. Hence why it was able to get certified, but not on a plane. And so that's, that was the whole reason she got the dog in the first place was for that piece. And yet this was not a suitable dog. That brings up a great point with owner trainers, too, because many simply, you know, they take on the thought of, I got this. I don't need help. But even trainers sometimes need help. And we can get so invested in a dog that we're too close to it. We may not see things that other people do. And I mean, I've asked a couple of times some of my really good friends, watch Azul in this situation. Is he happy here? Is he stressed? Is he annoyed? Is he too hot? You know, whatever need be, because I've wondered about it, because I try to keep my eyes open to stuff like that. We miss it being, especially when the dog is working for us. So even if you're an owner trainer, training your own service dog, and you know all about the training, it's good to have at least a good friend or trainer in your back pocket that you can say, hey, watch this yeah because if we feel like something's off we can easily dismiss it if it's just us that desire to want the dog to keep working but if we have somebody we trust to be open and honest with us that can really really help yeah and just getting that third party evaluation right that that's the reason why i do recommend people um do take some sort of test is that they get somebody else to get their eyes on the dog in a public place and they see stuff that you don't see. And uh, I know that anyone who comes and does a practice test with me, they're so thankful afterwards because, you know, they think, oh, my dog is weak in this, this area. And then when we actually go to do the practice test, I give them a completely different view. And I go, no, your dog actually seemed today anyway, seemed to be fine in this area. But here's actually where you need some work. And some surprising things can come out of it. Just recently, I did a practice test with a, a student and she... Um, she was like, oh, no, well, it was a new person. I didn't know her or her dog. So again, it was completely third party, no involvement prior to that. So I was able to actually give, you know, an honest opinion without being judgmental, just saying this is what I'm observing. And what it was was she she thought for sure the dog would nail the leave it because every time she's flicked food off the table and she's, um, you know, offered or dropped food on the floor and whatever, that piece of it, the dog has nailed it 100%. And yet, what she hadn't thought of was having someone else do that. And so I flicked it off the table and the dog dove for it. And the dog, as soon as the dog smelled any kind of food on me, I used cheese. The dog was like, Ooh, Oh, what do you got? And came right over and was like pushing into me. And, and she's like, Oh, well, you know, she never does that to me. And I said, well, I said, have you generalized it? 
What do you mean generalize? I said, you need to practice this with other people doing it so that she understands it's not just you. It's not just your husband. It's everybody this stands for. And th so those pieces can be really critical, but somebody else needs to help you with that. They need to observe that because you need that third party. The dog doesn't know and see that reaction. How well generalized is this behavior? If it's not, just go. And it's not a big deal. You can just go back and you just generalize it to other people. And then the dog can move forward with it. But you need to know that, right? And that's where the third party person comes in and goes, oh, you didn't consider this piece. And that's okay. Let's move forward with it. We actually just started offering third party evaluations with the crazy to calm coaches. You know, because I have my clients that I'm working with to train service dogs. And at some point in time, I can give them a practice test. But can I really be impartial? Right. right. You know what? Exactly. If I watch this puppy grow up, can I really be impartial? And so we have set up a video way to do it, actually three different video ways to do it, to make it accessible for everybody, no matter what their disability is. But so that the other crazy to calm canine coaches can then watch that and share feedback for that reason. You know, Cindy and Ashlyn don't have any connection to my clients. They might have a limited connection in the Facebook group that we're all in together, but they don't really have a connection to the dog, per se. Yeah. And we have, I think last I knew, we were up to like eight crazy to calm canine coaches. Wow. And so when we do our evaluations, it's required to be two coaches that have not directly worked with that person, two or more coaches, and they will go through and review and that's just a really neat process. I'm really like, I love the way it turned out and the way we did it. And that's something that we just started offering as we finished up, we did a service dog public access class. And so they were the first people that we offered it to. Mm -hmm. And now it's open to anybody who wants to take just that general third party evaluation, just to see where is your dog at? It's Perfect. not a, yes, your dog is perfect. It's a, Here's some things we think might help you. Here's some, you know, we saw this, this, and this. That was great, but maybe work on that. <laughs> yeah, and every dog needs something in every team. It's not just the dog. It's the team needs to work on stuff, right? And that's the big thing I find is that it is. It's about the team. It's about considering both members. Because um, often it is what the handler is doing is what is affecting how the dog's response is, right? So if the handler changes something even simple, that can often have a big impact on what the dog, how the dog responds. So totally. just knowing those little things. Cool. Um, okay. So, so we've kind of identified some situations with dogs. I mean, there's a myriad of different situations, but the thing is that um, we do need to um, look at ethically based responses um, to the, the challenges that we face. So how can you, I think this is a valid question is how can we, make those kinds of responses. Um, and I, for me, I find that if you get out of your head, because so often we get in our head, we get in our emotions. If we just deal with uh, learning to read the dog's body language, and that's a key factor in training a service dog or training any dog is learning what are the subtle signs that the dog is showing you that maybe he's not comfortable in a situation, maybe he doesn't wanna go into a situation, maybe he doesn't wanna do something while he's training. A uh, couple examples might be, you know, if you uh, give a cue and your dog looks away and he doesn't do the cue and he just kind of looks away, that's a signal. There's something going on. That's asking for time to process, or maybe he's asking for a bit of distance from that behavior and he's going, mm, nope, sorry, can't do it right in this moment. And then maybe he will do it in five or 10 seconds, but that you should be paying attention to that simple thing of looking away, right? Um, maybe sniffing. I had another client where every time she would uh, cue the dog to go to the bed, and the dog would just drop his head to the ground and sniffing. That's another quest for time. And especially when there's nothing to sniff. He was standing there a second ago. There's nothing going on. Nothing's been added to the environment. But suddenly he drops his head and sniff the ground. At, there's nothing that you can see. That's a stress sign. So you have to kind of sit back and examine and go, what's going on? Why, why is that cue or why is this environment stressful for my dog? And how can I change it so that it's not stressful? And in the case of, say, go bed um, as the one client, Maybe we need to back up and chain or train it or teach it, if you will, in a different way, you know, teach it by shaping. So the dog is never wrong. You can capture pieces of that as it goes until you get the ultimate behavior that you want. Then you re-add a new cue because obviously the old cue is poisoned. 
Um, and if you, you'll, you'll need to learn all that terminology, if you don't look it up, poison cues, it's a real thing. Um, and you know, so we need to reteach those behaviors and attach a new cue that the dog doesn't already associate with that bad feeling. Um, but, but those, those are the kinds of examples of things that you need to change. Um, another common one I find that I, I start with, especially early dogs is a trust building exercise is having the dogs be able to move through your legs, doing a figure eight. So we start with the nose target. I use it as a way of proofing the nose target, but it also gives me more information about how the dog feels being close to the handler, under the handler, near the handler. Um, so if the dog starts and is like really hesitant to even stick his legs or his nose between your legs, there's there's something going on for the dog. Is it fearful of small spaces? Is it a trust issue? Has the owner or the handler dropped something on them in the past? Um, I've got one client who always has a shoulder bag and the dog's actually developed a fear because every time she leans over, that bag hits the dog. It happens to be on the same side the dog is healing on. Um, so, and I kept urging her, no, get a backpack, get something that's more controlled. That's not going to fall on your dog. Well, by the time she did any movement on her body now triggered the dog's reflex, right? And, but she had built that up. Had she switched it earlier on, we probably could have avoided that whole situation. So it's all these little pieces that we really have to look at and address and just back the truck up and figure out how do we change it? How do we improve it for that dog? Um, so that we're not seeing those kinds of behaviors. Is the dog refusing to jump in a vehicle? That's a super common one. And there's many reasons why a dog might not want to jump in the in the vehicle. And if we go back to that list of five things, you know, medical is number one. Is there something going on with the hips or is the dog too heavily built to jump the height of the truck or the vehicle in order to get in? Maybe he needs a step ladder, maybe he needs a ramp. These kind of considerations would be my first. And I just had that happen with another student as well. Um, and so we kind of backed the truck up and yeah, the dog was way too stout, shall we say, or, or solidly built that the vehicle was too high. And what she had the dog do was rear up, put its paws on, and then she would kind of boost the bump. And I said, here's a great example of where a ramp or a step would be perfect. Right. And, and this person also down the road would not be able to hoist the dog simply because her physical disability was a degenerative one. So she's not going to have the physical strength later on. Um, so, I mean, there's the team right there, right? Like, let's look for the future of the team and figure out, but she was like, oh, you know, the dog always does, does this, but he doesn't want to do it now. Well, maybe that's one part of it. Maybe there's other things going on. It could be social. It could be emotional. Maybe the dog is fearful because last time he tried to get in the vehicle, he tripped. And so now he's worried about that, right? Or maybe from um, a, a social aspect, maybe the dog's not done yet. And I had that with my little German Shepherd mix. I started going out training in different locations and I started noticing we got back to the vehicle and she was like, I'm not getting in. And I was like, well, why aren't you getting in? You got in the first couple of times we went out. She's like, and I figured it out by looking at the context and looking at her responses. She just wasn't done yet. She thought was having too much fun. She didn't want to leave. She didn't want to go home because my pattern had been, we get out, we go train, we get back in the vehicle, we go home. So I had to really think about that. I actually, at the time, that was this was back when I was first starting my um, videos in 2008. And I was also taking a local training class. And I asked my trainer, I said, and she was a positive trainer. I said, what do I do? And she says, well, just pick her up and put her in. And I was like, yeah, but that doesn't treat the underlying reason. What's going on here? And she said, well, you know, you'll have to look at it. So I figured it out. It was, she wasn't done yet. And so I thought, well, how can we apply this without just picking her up and put her in. I don't want to be, you know, she was only a young pup at the time. I'm not a great big person. I don't have a lot of strength. I don't want to be lifting her up and putting her in the rest of her life. Plus she didn't want to get in. There must be a reason. Long story short, I thought, ah, pre mac principle. We can apply pre mac principle. If she doesn't want to go somewhere, then we can apply it. Okay, she's less likely to go into the car after an outing. So what can I do? I can get her to do something simple for me that's closer to getting into the car. So I just started with a nose target in the direction of the car. And then I said, okay, let's go. And we would go sniff. So then she could sniff around a little area and then we would come back closer to the car and I would get her to do something closer to the car. Ultimately back and forth, every pre-MAC practice was her getting to do what she wanted to do, which was stick around and do something fun, sniffing, doing tricks, whatever it was. And after about six or seven of those, she willingly hopped in the car and went, okay, I'm done. And I was like, okay, great, good. But I didn't end there. I had to keep going because if I continued that same pattern of going, getting in, coming home, I'm just reinforcing that same, I'm not done yet. She would keep doing that. So I had to take it the next step and go, okay, if 
going, getting out and going home is the problem, then how about we get in the car, get out, do a training session, get back in the car and go somewhere else fun. So we did that to four different places in the beginning. So she started going, oh, getting back in the car doesn't always mean going home. So I'm pre-mapping it by going somewhere fun, right? So we have to really think about those kinds of problem solving. And after about, I think, four training sessions of doing that, I had a dog that the rest of her life eagerly got in the car, got out, got in, no problem at all. So we can solve some of these underlying problems if we can look at what the reason is and what are some creative ways of solving those problems. See, Cindy, I, you had a question. Go ahead, Cindy. Well, I was just going to comment. I had a client with that's been having similar issues with trying to get their young lab to do things. First, it was the car. Then it was pause up. And I, they got the handler got the lab when the lab was just about a year old. And what we finally figured out the issue is, is I don't, it, the, do, the dog needs permission. And um, it was not the the owner of the dog previously is not an R positive person. And um, so I don't know. And the dog had also been it wasn't that the dog didn't want to get in the car. The dog had not been allowed to put himself in the car. She always picked him up and put him in the car. Ah, OK. Yeah. So, and that was not an option for his current people. So we had to work around that so we did a lot of oh there's lots of good cookies and good things to eat and um, now he'll get in the front or the back and he gets to go for pup cups periodically and so they've done some pre-mac after the cookies to get but we're trying i'm trying to work with them to teach the dog it's okay to try things that right because it gets scared when there's a mistake made and that can be a big issue Yep. The, the dogs that have to do everything right is that a real challenge. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I had a similar issue with when it first got Lucy, the day I went to take her home, she came from a family with kids and uh, they were on an acreage and she always traveled in the back of the pickup in the canopy. That's just where the dogs traveled. They have another dog as well. And so she would not get in my car and she'd never traveled in a car. And so I was like, okay, how do I get this dog in the car? And unfortunately for me, she's a very willing er learner and always has it. She was actually afraid of the clicker the first couple of times that we used it. And I had to condition her against that. Well, that didn't take long at all because I involved food and she's a chow hound. Um, but anyway, what I ended up doing was using social learning. So I had the kids crawl in the car. And when the kids crawled in the car, she was like, oh, I can go in after the kids. So I just had them crawl in one side. They crawled out the other, shut the door behind them. And I now had her in the car. And she wasn't, you know, she wasn't like it was a space issue. She wasn't confinement. It was just she had never been in a car and no one had told her that it was OK to go in a car. So when she saw the kids doing it, because she often mimicked the kids, she just climbed in with him and that solved the problem in the moment. And after that, she had no problem. She was like, oh, I'm allowed to do this. Not a problem. Okay. Next. I don't next. So, yeah, so we have to be creative in looking at what the reasons are. I love that, Cindy. Or Cindy, or Cindy that was awesome. Um, you know, because we never know what, what the previous history is, right? So we have to kind of assess that and figure out. And then how do we creatively problem solve that? And I, I think that is a lot of what it comes down to, too, is we have to take the time to be creative and come up with these kinds of solutions um, as part of the ethics, because I mean, easily we could come up with other ways that are that some people wouldn't deem ethical um, or that would you know be somewhere else on the ethical continuum. Um, I like to just be creative and go, okay, what's the problem? Like I had Lucy would jump up because she'd been raised by young children. When we first got her, she would literally jump up. I take the food dish. She would literally jump up, knock it out of my hands because she'd been able to do it with the kids. So she had this history for almost two years of doing that. And I was like, well, I could tell her to go bed and walk and place it. And then I don't know, like, let's play with this. Let's be creative. Let's learn what we can learn from the situation. There was no rush. And I, as I said, I don't think there's a rush to do anything. You take it as you are where you're at it. But if you take that time to be a bit creative, I came up with the idea of, okay, let's learn about stimulus control. How can I put this on stimulus control? So she doesn't jump up and push the, the food dish out of my, and I mean, it would go everywhere, right? We started with feeding the, the raw and we had raw food everywhere when she knocked it out of your hands. It was gross, right? Um, so, but just being creative. And so what I did was I turned that, um, the cue of the dish into a stimulus control issue. So the, the dish became jump and then I added a verbal cue, Boeing. So now I had Boeing, which was jumping up on cue. And you can see on the video that I've got, 
she, when she realizes that I'm capturing the jumping, she throws herself into it like, what can we jump? And so I had this wonderful little trick that I could do of her jumping up, but by putting it under stimulus control, meaning when I didn't cue it, she didn't do it, right? That's the big part of stimulus control. Uh, I now had a dog that could walk at my side until I cued it. I would get, let her jump up and then I would put the dish down. And then I was able just to phase that out entirely. So she never jumped for the food dish anymore. So if we use creativity and it's so much more fun for us because it's problem solving, especially like problem solving. Um, and it's so much more fun for the dog. Then you're strengthening that relationship, right? And you're not even going any kind of ethical, you don't have to make choices about you know, whether you're willing to use punishment or not. You're just using your creativity to solve the problem and skirting around that altogether. Oh, you're muted there, Penny. I know we are a little bit over and so almost out of time and there's a lot of things we haven't discussed yet. So uh -huh. what do you think is like most important? Like if you had one ethical thing you could leave with people what would that be <laughs> that's a great question um i suggest that people um consider their situation in the moment that they're in because as we know it all changed we've talked about that right um and you have to decide what impacts that your choices have on you and your dog so you as a team um, and you may react today in one way, but strive for changing your behavior tomorrow to make a better choice for you and your team. And if everybody did that, I think very quickly, we'd have a lot of people thinking more about the impacts of their behavior on their dogs. And we'd have a lot more cohesiveness among the, uh, the dog and the handler as far as connectedness goes. And we'd have a lot more harmonious relationships as well. And building that strong bond that everybody wants, right? That relationship, that's what everybody wants. That's what everybody hopes for. Um, I think that would be one way to achieve that. And, uh, you know, it's, and if everybody focused on that one thing, I think that would move towards in that direction. I love that. And like, I don't think we will ever get 100% cohesiveness from service dog handler to service dog handler to service dog handler, you know, we're never all going to be on the exact same page yeah. because it's all about our experiences. But if we can get that cohesiveness with our dog, that partnership that, you know, some people like to refer of it as bond, but I realize that bond, the word bond with your dog means so much different to so many different people. So sure. I love the whole term cohesiveness. And so that you guys, you and your dog are working together, making choices that benefit you both as much as possible. <laughs> yep. And help you be functional in the environment that you're working in, right? Because yes. the functionality is a real key part as well. So, yeah. yeah. Always training towards the environments we want to be able to work in. <laughs> yep. yep. But for yep. the environments that we're working in right now. And yeah. I know a big one there is people that have the younger dogs and they are they also either have a job or are looking to get a job, want to be able to take that dog to work with them at some point in time, which I mean, I own a training center. So easy for me, right? Not so easy for other people. But you know, that line of they know where their dog, what their dog is capable of now, even if their goal is to take that dog to college with them. You know, what are the next steps to help prepare that dog for my end goals, for what I want to do next year or the year after? Yeah, for the working the working situation that the dog is going to be in. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of questions about taking that dog to college because that tends to be when people tend to be a little bit wilder or at their wildest point in life. True. And is it fair to leave your dog in a dorm while you, or take your dog to a frat party? Probably not. Yeah. There are lots um, of questions around that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't get talked about. Yeah. About yeah. Well, and and the, the handlers may not have the maturity at that level to even think about it and consider those kinds of things. Right. Again, oh, it's yeah. just a task oriented. We're doing this. And then later they kind of go shake their head and go, what was I thinking back then? Well, you were three or four years younger. You weren't, you weren't, 
you know, um, physiologically mature, right? Like we know most um, people, um, men in particular, aren't mature socially until 24 years of age, for example, right? So, you know, two or three years in that time range can make a big difference. Females, it's the same thing. That The age is slightly different. They tend to mature a little bit younger, um, but then you've got other things going on. There's physical maturity and all of that kind of stuff as well. So yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of things to consider, but, and all of us have been there, especially those of us who have been, you know, we're a little older in life. We've, uh, we've had some experience. We kind of look back and go, what were we thinking? And, you know, why, why were somebody let us do that? I can't believe we did that. Right. So we all do that kind of stuff. It's part of learning, um, but hopefully we can learn from other teams and learn from, you know, in the positive way of, seeing what other people do and what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing with uh, with um, our dogs and making those kinds of choices that are good for us as opposed to bad in the long run, if you will. And of course, good and bad are all relative, um, but we won't go there because that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> that's why I'm very, very open about my mistakes and the things that I've done wrong <laughs> because so many times we see dogs behaving perfectly. Um, service dogs behaving perfectly, family pets behaving perfectly at the family barbecue reunion, whatever. Yeah. But we don't see a lot of dogs. I don't want to say misbehaving because that is even saying that maybe it's the dog's fault, but, you know, not They're acting as to what would be expected for the social norm in that environment. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> and so when we look at that, you know, we've all made mistakes. Like I had said earlier, my mistake of Raza's first restaurant experience, not typically the way I do it. It happened to work for us, but not typically the way I do it. And I would never advise a client to do that. <laughs> yep. But it's all about knowing your dog and knowing you and knowing what can you handle as a team. And if people started thinking about it in that way, I think that would clear up a lot of the ethics in the service dog community. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank you for having me. Ethical debates. <laughs> yeah, thank you yeah. for coming. We really appreciate your your opinions and your advice and joining us. And you're welcome yeah. to join us anytime for Service Dog Handler Chat. Oh, sure. No, that sounds like fun. It all depends yes. on fitting it in the schedule. But yeah, no, definitely. I'll, I'll check in now and then and see what kind of topics are coming up and we That'd have a really great lineup for the rest of the year. October, we have Dr. Holly Tett from the UK joining to talk about mental health in the service dog community. Perfect. You know, how can we, no matter what our disabilities are, keep us in the best frame of mind to work a service dog? <laughs> so not necessarily dealing with people with mental health disabilities, but just as a service dog handler in general, dealing with life. And then in November, we have Grisha Stewart coming to talk to us about noticing needs in our dogs, physical, mental, and emotional needs our dogs have, and how we can notice them and then help with them. Perfect. And that'll be it for this year. And then we'll start with um, guests next year. So if you want to come back next year and talk about something, let us know. We're more than welcome to have you chat. Okay. That'd be lovely. Yeah. Sounds good. And with that, everybody have a great day. Yes.